Well, I would like to now introduce our second guest, who is not only a great structural engineer, but a good friend. Uh, Jerome F. Hajar is the CDM Smith Professor and Department Chair at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at Northeastern. He is also Director of the Laboratory for Structural Testing of Resilient and Sustainable Systems, known as the STRESS Laboratory. He has served as Chair of the Structures Faculty and Deputy Director of the Mid-America Earthquake Center at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, was a faculty member at the University of Minnesota, and was a structural engineer and associate at Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, where I also used to work. Hajar received a BS uh, in Engineering Mechanics from Yale University and an MS and PhD in Structural Engineering from Cornell University. His research and teaching interests include analysis, experimental testing, and design of steel and composite steel concrete building and bridge structures regional modeling and assessment of infrastructure systems and earthquake engineering, and he has published over 190 papers and edited three books on these topics. Hajar serves on the American Institute of Steel Construction Committee on specifications and several of its task committees, and is a member of the executive committee of the Technical Activities Division of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Structural Engineering Institute, and he was made a fellow of the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers in 2007 and of SEI in 2013. He was awarded the 2010 Popular Mechanics Breakthrough Award, the 2009 ASCE Shortridge Hardesty Award, the 2005 AISC TR Higgins Lectureship Award, the 2004 AISC Special Achievement Award, the 2003 ASCE Walter L. Huber Civil Engineering Research Prize, and the 2000 ASCE Norman Medal for his research on steel structures, composite construction, structural stability. He has also won several teaching awards. Dr. Hajar is a professional engineer in Illinois and Minnesota, and thankfully I have made it through his introduction, and so please join me in welcoming Jer Jerome Hajar. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, so pleased to be here. I'd like to thank uh, George Thrush for the introduction. Didn't realize he was going to read the entire uh, introduction there. I appreciate that. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about understanding design. And in particular, we'll be talking about understanding design from the standpoint of a, of a structural engineer, uh, touching a little bit on some other disciplines, uh, including architecture. And uh, for the last several years, I've been working on trying to build resilience and sustainability into structural engineering. These are two terms we'll talk about today. Uh, we've heard the words a lot. Uh, I'm trying to give them meaning within our profession because it will uh, be quite transformative uh, for structural engineering. Today, the story starts in Kobe, Japan, uh, a beautiful city on the south central part of Japan. Uh, part of a triumvirate of cities, including Kobe, uh, uh, inclu including Kobe, Kyoto, and Osaka. Uh, Kobe is uh, quite an international city because it was one of the very few that opened up in the mid-1800s to international travelers after Japan had been secluded as an island uh, for over 200 years. Um, it was a very distinctive port city for many years, and because of this, it has some beautiful architecture, uh, including a, a famous house by Frank Lloyd Wright. When I go, I stay in the Portopia Hotel, and this is the view from the breakfast, breakfast room looking over uh, the spectacular harbor. Uh, I would venture to say that many people in the US haven't heard of Kobe, um, or at least hadn't heard of it until they had a major earthquake in 1995. This was a magnitude 6.8 earthquake, January 17th, 1995. Uh, it's on the high side of a moderate earthquake, what we would consider to be a moderate earthquake. And the devastation across the city was quite comprehensive. Uh, significant fires following the earthquake. Uh, the port facility uh, was devastated. Uh, housing stock uh, was ruined. Uh, engineered buildings uh, collapsed completely. Transportation infrastructure um, was destroyed. 
This is the longest bridge in the world. It was under construction at the time. Uh, and the two pylons moved relative to one another by about a meter because of the earthquake. They had to completely redesign the bridge in order to finish its construction. Uh, Kobe was the sixth largest port in the world at the time of the earthquake. Sixth largest port in the world, instrumental to Japanese commerce. Part of understanding design is to empathize, uh, to understand your clients, to understand your owners, to understand the community for which you're designing. And for a structural engineer, there might be no better way to do that than to go to the Kobe Earthquake Memorial Museum that they constructed after the event. The docents are survivors still from the earthquake. And in their uh, broken English and my broken Japanese, uh, we had a fairly extensive discussion about what it was like uh, to be in the city in the days and the months and in fact years that it's taken to rebuild the city. And of course this happens over and over again around the world. 70,000 dead just a few years ago in China, whole villages leveled to the ground in Pakistan 2005, 255,000 estimated dead um, in the Great Tangshan earthquake in China. In 2011, uh, the tsunami and earthquake in Japan, and particularly the tsunami, showed just what level of destruction is possible uh, from, from an earthquake. Uh, with the nuclear power plant there, uh, still a highly contaminated site, huge evacuations around the region um, that is going to last for decades to come. And what do we do with a city like Istanbul, uh, one of the most architecturally beautiful cities in the world? Uh, and in my opinion, perhaps most vulnerable to an earthquake. If you look at the North Anatolian Fault, uh, it's been unzipping right towards Istanbul, which is on the upper left. Uh, you can look at the earthquake epicenters, 1939, 1942, 1943, 1951, 1957, 1967, going from right to left. 1992, Izmit, just 30 uh, miles or so outside of Istanbul. This shows the energy release along the faults uh, in the successive earthquakes. 10 million people live in Istanbul. If you look at a country like Japan, 100 million people, the entire country is a high seismic zone. And of course, this is not relevant just for far off portions of the world. Uh, January 17th, 1994, Northridge earthquake uh, killed relatively small number of people, 57 people, as compared to several thousand in Kobe. Uh, and of course, Jap Japan, I would consider to be the most uh, seismically prepared country in the world. Uh, but the Northridge earthquake was the costliest natural disaster in the country's history. I would venture to wonder how many of you have heard of this uh, earthquake event uh, from about 20 years ago. Costliest natural disaster until the levee broke in New Orleans in Hurricane Katrina. And I would say the losses from Superstorm Sandy are starting to um, surpass what happened in Northridge. But it was certainly a very significant event. And yet, if you look at the condemned structures, 1,600 timber, mostly houses, not too many, uh, unless you own one. 300 engineered concrete structures, only 10 steel structures. How can the economic loss and the devastation of the region mount so quickly? Uh, for steel structures, consider the premier structural system at the time for multi-story buildings. Uh, we have what we call moment-resisting frames with steel girders framing into steel columns. Uh, these were supposed to be able to with, withstand uh, significant earthquakes. And Northridge earthquake, magnitude 6.7, again like Kobe, on the high side of a moderate earthquake. And uh, they had numerous buildings, steel buildings, that had fractures in the connections between the girders and the columns. These were unexpected fractures at the time. Uh, one wonders and can consider in hindsight whether they should have been expected. They were unexpected at the time, discovered in the weeks after the earthquake, uh, and as a result, the building officials in Southern California shut down steel construction for several years. And if you shut down steel construction in an area, you'll devastate the economy, and that's what happened. This is a typical shot of one of the fractures that occurred. This is a steel girder flange, flange framing into a column, column flange, pulling a whole divot of steel out of the column flange. It takes a, a large amount of energy to be able to do that. 
And you can look at a, at a typical case study. This is the Borax uh, corporate world headquarters. Borax is a privately owned company, and at the time it was self-insured, brand new world headquarters designed to code by a perfectly uh, good engineer. And um, the way in which the floor framing uh, plays out is indicative of how we've been des designing structures um, for many years now. And in particular, it's a little bit hard to see, but there's little triangles uh, in this floor plan between the beams and the columns. Those are meant to be moment resisting, seismically um, designed connections. And you could see two lines in the vertical direction along the perimeter and two lines in the horizontal direction. And then all the other columns in the middle don't have any triangles on them. They're called gravity columns. They're just holding the gravity load. And so as this structure sways back and forth, all that inertia mass from the interior shoots out to the exterior, which is supposed to uh, withstand the earthquake and bring those forces down to the ground. As a result of concentrating all this force, even though it's a four-story building, we have to use very large structural members, 14 by 233, 233 pounds per foot for that steel column, for example. Quite large, given the size of the building. And this just shows a schematic of the types of fracture damage that occurred um, in these connections, fracturing through the welds, sometimes fracturing right through the columns. And so if you look at those same elevations on the steel structures, you could see uh, the nomenclature for the damage that occurred. Brand new building, basically the entire seismic system had cracks all over it. This is extremely expensive to repair, uh, and in some uh, cases, you have to condemn. So the state of the art uh, for structural engineering in this country, and it really remains so now, is that for a large earthquake, we design it to not collapse. And indeed, we had very few collapses here in this moderate earthquake. We design it not to collapse, but we don't design it not to be damaged. Uh, it could be so damaged that you have to condemn the structure after. Very few owners understand this, and I would say very few members of the public understand this. Ideally, in a moderate earthquake, you might have significant structural damage, but repairable. And in a light earthquake, hopefully no structural damage, but maybe some non-structural damage. That's our state of practice right now. If you look at a city like Boston, um, we're much more vulnerable, of course, uh, because the uh, relationship between the seismic risk uh, and the cost to upgrade for seismic um, is still something that's being talked about here. And of course, we're not just talking about earthquakes, uh, particularly in the face of climate change and some of the extreme events. Uh, we're seeing increased potential for significant hurricanes occurring. This shot from Superstorm Sandy. And if you look at the storm surge that inundates uh, the coastline, uh, really quite similar uh, to the effects from a tsunami, although the characteristics and cause, of course, is quite different. Uh, downtown Boston has had significant flooding from storm surge events such as this. And if you look, for example, at one of the key infrastructure components of the city, Massachusetts Port Authority Logan Airport, it's right at sea level. Um, Port Authority, quite progressive, aware of the issues here, particularly after Sandy, uh, trying to think about how to um, prevent this from happening. Sixth largest port of the, in the world, Kobe was, and then in 30 seconds, it dropped off the face of the earth, uh, with the economy still never, in, never recovering. Shipping traffic quickly goes to other ports, uh, very, very hard to get that business back, right at a time when shipping traffic is going up exponentially. If you look at the seismic threats uh, along um, in the United States, you could see, of course, the West Coast, Mid-America, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, again, relationship between seismic hazard and policies in the Northeast and other parts of the country still evolving. Uh, you could look at hurricane threats similarly. You could look at a port like Long Beach, which is really instrumental to the economic well-being of the United States, highly vulnerable uh, to uh, seismic events. So what does it mean to be resilient? It means we want to be able to bounce back quickly from a hazardous event. We talk about community resilience. Uh, we talk about infrastructure system resilience. We talk about component, individual building resilience. And all of these has to play together. Meanwhile, uh, we're thinking increasingly about sustainability, sustainable resource engineering, 
in structural engineering. What does it mean to do sustainable resource engineering within civil structural engineering? Well, when I talk to too many of my structural engineering colleagues, they say, this is not really what I do. This is not what I think about. I think about life safety. I think about minimum material costs uh, for structures. Uh, this is not my core expertise. This is for architects. This is for mechanical electrical plumbing engineers, cladding engineers, material producers, contractors. In short, everybody but me. And so this has meant that the structural engineering community in particular has really not had a seat at the table for defining sustainability. Now many of you are probably familiar with LEAD, uh, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. They provide guidelines for doing sustainable design of buildings. Uh, some people say, well, I design for sustainability because I design for LEAD. LEAD is predominantly a, a point system. Uh, you get 1 to 14 points for materials and resources, 1 to 5 points for innovation. Uh, and of course, there are other metric systems around the world uh, that are being produced. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that we're making progress in this area of understanding the relationship of uh, various elements of sustainability to design. But I, I would say that our understanding now through something like LEED is where we were with building codes for life safety about 100 years ago. I think we have a long way to go. And uh, it, construction and use of commercial and residential buildings consumes about 40% of the energy use in this country, about 40% of all material consumption, 40% of all waste, 40% of all greenhouse gases, plus or minus. Uh, about 30% is in transportation, about 30% uh, is in industry for energy use. Uh, but with this kind of statistic, certainly the building profession, the structural engineering profession should have a major voice on this topic. Understanding design for me uh, was rooted in some uh, fairly classical instruction that I received when I was an undergraduate and a graduate student, uh, learning from greats like Les Robertson, uh, designer of uh, I.M. Pei's landmark Bank of China building, designer of the World Trade Centers that collapsed uh, in New York, uh, outstanding structural engineer with deep relationships with architects. And in fact, years earlier, I took a course on architectural history with the great Vincent Scully, one of the greatest architectural historians. Wrote some fine books uh, on architecture, architectural history. Taught me a lot about form, uh, function, um, aesthetics and other classical elements of understanding design. And he made us read a lot. Uh, Louis Sullivan, the great Frank Lloyd Wright, Robert Venturi, Learning from Las Vegas, interesting book. And so we build up these traditions of understanding design and to break free to bring resilience, sustainability, and other such comment, uh, concepts in, not easy. When I graduated with my PhD, I said, I'm never going back to academia. Never, never, never. I went to work for SOM, got to do interesting uh, uh, design problems, such as uh, the circus flyers from the great sculptor George Siegel. Got to design skyscrapers, such as this one, which is in Times Square, right across the street from where the, the ball drops on New Year's. I designed that architectural truss that you see up at the prow. A book was written about this building, how a thousand men and women worked around the clock for five years and lost $200 million building a skyscraper. That pretty much sums up the working world on some days. Uh, I was one of the thousand. Well, things evolve. And uh, in my years in academia, sometimes I think about very specific designs, do some consulting, but a lot I think about the design process. And with some colleagues at Stanford University, uh, Greg Deerline leading the charge there, we've been focusing on what we call unsustainable engineering, where we have costly permanent damage, uh, potentially having to uh, condemn a building after a significant event. In our opinion, cost neutral, uh, we can do better. Uh, this is an example of one system, um, and I'm sorry this is supposed to be rocking back and forth, but it's not. Uh, but you can perhaps envision it rocking back and forth. Uh, this is a rethinking of uh, a basic structural system. So what we see here are two steel brace frames that would be the primary lateral system in the building. Uh, and three innovations in this system. First, the brace frames are allowed to rock free 
from the foundation uh, rather than fixing them to the ground. Second, we use that movement to engage what we call replaceable energy dissipating fuses. Uh, and these are the gold elements that you see here. Those are standard plate steel with diamond shaped cutouts in them uh, that are very good in shear, being able to shear back and forth about 30%. And then the green lines are representing vertical post tensioning, uh, which then snaps the building back to vertical. And if needed, you pop out the old fuses, put in the new ones, and you're ready to go again. The idea here is to focus all the damage in these replaceable fuses rather than in the rest of the structural system. We went through a lot of steps in the research for this, but it culminated in a test at E-Defense, the largest shake table uh, in the known universe, uh, which is outside of Kobe. This was Japan's response from a research uh, standpoint. After the Kobe earthquake, they built this very large shake table. This is why I go to Kobe periodically. And we could see here in the schematic, um, the gray frames are meant to be inertial mass. Uh, these are linear sliders at each of three floors so they could slide back and forth as this large shake table shakes. And then our structural system is the gold here. It's a steel brace frame and the fuse in this case is down at the uh, bottom center. And so as the frame shakes back and forth, rocks back and forth, uh, the white post goes up and down and shears the fuse that you could see there. So the energy from the earthquake focused on, on that fuse. Uh, you could see the steel specimen being dropped into place here between the inertial masses. On the right, you could see uh, a man standing there, so you get a sense uh, for the scale. This is at uh, two-thirds scale. The Japanese uh, were very nervous that the rocking system was going to fracture prematurely and that one of those linear sliding systems were going to slide right off because the only thing holding them down is that they're connected to the rocking system and uh, destroy their shake table. So we had some discussions about that. Okay, let me call up a movie here to show the system in action. This shows uh, an overview of the system on the lower right, an elevation view, and you'll see those frames sliding back and forth. It's hard to see the gold specimen behind it. The fuse is on the bottom left, to zoom in on it, and you'll see it shearing back and forth. And then on the top left and right are the two corners at the base. You'll see them rocking back and forth in a trough. So there's the fuse in action. And that plate with the diamond-shaped cutouts is able to shear quite nicely. And then on either side of the fuse, you can see some vertical post tensioning that's snapping the whole system back to vertical. That was so much fun, let's watch it again. This earthquake was about two times the size of the Northridge earthquake. And of course, we ran a whole series of these, different earthquakes, and many different configurations of the fuses themselves were, um, were looked at in a variety of ways in the years earlier, before we came upon the butterfly fuse as we call it, as uh, the most cost-effective solution. Using standard structural materials here, reconfigured uh, in a different way. It worked. Uh, you can put this system into a variety of different configurations, uh, such as we see here. And some early adopters are already using it. This is the Orinda City, California offices, uh, Tipping Marr, uh, David Marr, great structural engineer. Uh, the fuse here is, are, are the angles down at the base, which rock back and forth as this system rocks back and forth. And then there's vertical post tensioning running up the columns to write this after a significant event. Butterfly fuses used in the USC School of Cinematic Arts from Greg Luth. Hewlett Packard headquarters used in the controlled rocking system. Starting to envision multi-story systems where maybe the fuse takes up an entire first floor. And we're starting to study ideas like this at the stress lab that uh, George Thrush mentioned out on our Burlington campus at the George J. Costas Research Institute for Homeland Security. This is a view of the stress lab, which has capacity to test full-scale structures to failure 
through a strong floor facility that we have in place there. Um, and just some other examples of uh, ideas to make our systems more resilient and or more sustainable. Uh, one of my PhD students, Li Zhang Wang, looking at design for deconstruction, taking um, ubiquitous composite construction, concrete floor plates and steel buildings, and rethinking the whole system to be able to take the whole building apart at the end of its useful life and repurpose the components instead of recycling all the materials. Of course, recycling a great step forward still requires a lot of energy. This fits right in the framework of bolted steel frame designs that are starting to be developed out in the west coast with all bolted construction uh, so that it's readily deconstructible. This shows some examples of some of the test setups that we'll be looking at. One of my postdocs, Kara Peterman, working on thermal break strategies for cladding systems. We see an infrared here of a building showing heat loss at each floor, like uh, an exhaust fan at each floor. Uh, we're going to be looking at methods to mitigate the heat loss because steel conducts heat so well, and to some extent concrete as well, by using some in innovative materials in the cladding systems uh, and the structural connections. Both of those projects have practitioner co-PIs who are very interested in this. Uh, one of my former postdocs uh, and I looking at topology optimization, computational methods for rethinking the topology of our structures, uh, and starting to put there um, other objectives besides just minimum weight, starting to think about sustainability, for example. Uh, Bill Baker at SOM, one of the great structural engineers using topology optimization regularly, coming up with a mega brace frame system like we see here. Very innovative, although from what I could tell, Leonardo da Vinci had this figured out some time ago as well. Of course, understanding design and executing design like this takes large teams, often interdisciplinary teams, uh, and I encourage you to pursue that with vigor. And it takes many, many different ideas. Uh, the controlled rocking work that I showed to get the proposal funded by the National Science Foundation, we had to submit it three times, uh, 2003, 2004, 2005. This is one of the ideas, this is the idea that we submitted in 2004. Uh, whereby we had the whole building foundation uh, culminating in a cup sitting in a ball uh, so that the whole building would rock back and forth in this ball and cup and then you have the post tensioning there going through the foundation to snap it back and forth. Possibly one of the worst ideas I've ever come up with. And uh, so, you know, you rewrite and you resubmit. You rethink uh, and you learn from the comments that you receive. Thank you. Welcome to our kitchen table. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, um, that was fantastic. Um, and I, I, th I don't know how much the students knew about what we were going to be talking about today, but that is absolutely fascinating stuff. By, th by the way, since you are the chair of civil and environmental engineering, I thought I'd ask our engineers in the audience to raise their hands. Oh, yes. <laughs> Anyway, so we have a fairly high engineering presence here, I think. Great. Um, well, I wanted to um, start, you know, you heard me uh, before we got started going on about the sort of five terms that we've been using, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And, you know, I think probably most of us don't usually think of structural engineering as something that requires empathy. You know, our first guest, Karen Kaplan, in advertising, you can absolutely get it right away that it's actually a core of what they do, is to try to understand the world from someone else's perspective. But maybe if you wanted to expand a little bit about how you use empathy or empathize with users, owners, citizens. Sure. So, of course, in structural engineering, uh, life safety is really one of our preeminent design goals and that implicitly has empathy to it. Sure, sure. Um, uh, but really, if you think about resilience, uh, for example, I would like to take the empathy much deeper. Right. right. Uh, where you actually uh, work to try to be able to have uh, structures be readily usable, right. even after significant events, uh, where you think about how the structure and whatever the function of that structure is plays into the community, right. uh, because it's actually very intertwined, and we think so little about that now. And design. 
Right. So those are just a couple of examples. Well, I think your point about, um, I was shocked about the Northridge quake economic consequences. And also about, you know, when we talk about sustainability and we, after Superstorm Sandy, I think maybe there was a, that was a real kind of uh, consciousness changing event for Americans. I mean, it's still not enough, but, but there's a, a, a sense that, wow, these, these things aren't just uh, something for us to argue about politically, but they are actually things that are gonna have major economic consequences. We I've often talked with colleagues here, if that same storm had hit Boston, good God, it would have been a fiasco. Yes. Um, but, um, but we think about it maybe in, in those sort of disaster kind of terms and not in the, the consequences, the larger consequences kind of terms, and we talk about the economic vitality of Kobe changing so dramatically in 1995, um, it, I guess it just makes that all the more imperative. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I started to think about this question of empathy for a structural engineer and especially someone involved with seismic stuff, I, I first thought maybe in a more literal sense about the uh, degree of movement that people are willing to tolerate uh, in tall buildings. Hmm. Be, maybe, maybe you want to tell, uh, I, I, probably not everybody in here understands how before, we'll get to your, the sort of radical, radically different kind of seismic thing you're dealing with here, but the sort of evolution of dealing with seismic design in, in new construction over the last 50 years is, is, is mostly about flexibility, no? Uh, well, it builds in a lot of things. So first, uh, of course, all buildings do move uh, in, in significant events, and tall buildings will be swaying back and forth uh, quite noticeably, even on standard uh, windy days. Right, right. Uh, I always encourage my students to go to the top of the restaurant uh, at the top of a tall building, order some soup, uh, don't eat the soup, watch the soup move. <laughs> right. And um, you know, there are two key elements of structural design, which are stiffness, which relates to how much it deflects, and strength, which relates predominantly to how much the materials can um, absorb be before uh, predominantly changing their behavior and starting to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has been a, a pretty lengthy progression of understanding to really be able to improve our structural design for earthquakes, even to the point of, of being able to achieve better life safety and a particular collapse prevention. Uh, so right now when we design buildings still for these extreme events, uh, the material has significant nonlinearity, meaning that it changes its properties during the earthquake. Mm. Uh, so we have to understand how that happens in order to understand how to design uh, to accommodate this. And uh, 50, 60 years ago, we had much less understanding of those mm. types mm. of things. So those were the first places where the innovations were made basic material understanding uh, and the impact. Uh, and in terms of uh, empathizing, I think, um, you know, uh, you design a building for earthquake, but you're also designing it for wind. Mm -hmm. You're designing it mm -hmm. for daily serviceability. And so all of these things have to come into play and intertwine. Right, right. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting cause, just because um, it seems that there are some, I, I've, I've been told by engineers that, that there, are, um, there are some levels of movement in buildings that would be perfectly fine and are perfectly safe. The limitation is not safety, but is human uh, comfort. comfort. That's and, uh, absolutely right. Yeah. Yes. So, all right. So we could make uh, buildings, particularly tall buildings, in many cases, much more flexible than we do now. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a case where serviceability, we call it, um, and a particular vibrational response is controlling the design. And that might be actually, if you were only optimizing for surviving an earthquake, yes. it might be better for it to be more flexible, no? Uh, yep, it could, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yes, because uh, earthquakes tend to excite at higher frequencies. So if you sway back and forth quite slowly, um, that has certain advantages for an earthquake. Mm. You're absolutely right. right. That's why these issues intertwine. Right, right, interesting. Well, so um, let's segue from, from empathy to, and, and with each guest, there will probably be one or two of these five words that are more at the core of, of, of what you do, even if you, even if you touch on all five, and I think most, uh, most everyone does. Um, but the second one is, is really one of my favorites. Uh, the, the, the Stanford D Design School, within the business school, uses these words, and that's why we've sort of co-opted their language, but in, in place of define, I often say questioning the question, 
which problem are you trying to solve? Because just as you just said, the, um, the problem you're focusing on is, 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 super, is a super important part of the design process. So when you guys said basically, rather than trying to make the entire structure uh, flexible and accommodate all this uh, seismic load, we're gonna try to isolate the place so there's only one problem area that then lends to a replaceable fuse kind of thing. Help us understand how you ended up defining the problem differently than your predecessors, because this is quite radical, is it not? I mean, it's, this is, there aren't, other, there aren't other people who were doing this before, I don't think. Uh, it, it, it is a radical departure. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a small core of people, certainly, mm -hmm. that are working on it, and an increasingly larger core as we try to get it into the building codes. And for me, it developed, um, in the intense meetings that happened after the Northridge, California earthquake. Mm -hmm. uh, the Northridge earthquake was a disaster for those of us uh, in the steel industry that we needed to uh, work on very intently um, in the years to come. And in fact, uh, they created a whole research program through the National Science Foundation, through FEMA, through American Institute of Steel Construction, uh, in order to look at the problem of uh, why did this happen? What caused this to happen in these premier seismic systems? Um, and then how do we prevent it from happening again? Mm -hmm. And as the design solutions came forward from myself and others, many others, uh, on how to prevent it from happening again, um, several of us uh, certainly noticed a common theme, which is that we were just shifting the damage uh, about 12 inches uh, downstream. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of fracturing right at the connection, we were having significant, uh, we call it local buckling and yielding mm -hmm. uh, in the beam. Mm -hmm. uh, damage that is more ductile, it's not as uh, sudden. Mm. Um, mm. It's perhaps more repairable, but I question that. Mm -hmm. um, and in my opinion, it was insufficient. Mm -hmm. And I think in the opinion of a number of people. It was a necessary step in an evolutionary process of needing to come up with some solutions. Mm -hmm. um, I took my sabbatical at Stanford in 2000, 2001, just mm. as these solutions were coming into fruition and starting to get put into the national code. That's when Greg Deerline and I started thinking about um, whether there's a way to reshape how we do this. Hmm. Well, it's, it's, it, it's, really, it's really interesting, and, and the uh, economics of it are, are staggering. I mean, the idea that, uh, as you say, the problem, let's, I'm, let, I'm probably going to oversimplify this, so stop me if I go too far, but if the problem before was to um, ensure that buildings could uh, survive and not crush me uh, in, a, in an earthquake of a certain strength. Um, they were doing that. The, and and your, your, your initial in information was about how at Northridge, it's not like that many people were killed. That's right. Very few people were killed. That's um, right. Especially considering how, how powerful the earthquake was. But that it caused lots and lots of structural systems. So the buildings didn't get condemned. That, but they obviously had to be repaired. They had to be repaired, yep. And of course, there are other situations from Northridge that caused the economic uh, catastrophe. The steel buildings were, were a component of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but that's right. Yeah. I, it's interesting. I, maybe it's my, my distance from uh, everyday practice, but I have never, I didn't know that they had put a moratorium on steel construction. Yep. And has that been, has that been resolved in some oh, way? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because of the work that we did in order to document what happened and understand what happened. Right. Um, at, when I was at University of Minnesota, we did some fundamental tests on the structural causes of the failure. Why, in particular, the fractures all occurred at the bottom flange, not mm. the top flange. Mm. Uh, and then some other great work around the country that, uh, on really the dominant reason for the failure, which was that we're using brittle uh, weld material. Mm. And in fact, this is a lesson for the construction industry uh, in that, you know, if you look at aerospace, uh, if you look at shipping, uh, they would never use the low quality weld material that we were using in construction. We were going for low cost. Right, right. Uh, and um, there was a, a lawsuit uh, after for the, to the welding company, uh, holding, trying to hold them responsible right, right. Uh, for this. And, and I believe that lawsuit was not successful. Right, right. Um, And it probably shouldn't have been. But, um, you know, we were using inexpensive materials because we thought it was okay. Right. And uh, that weld material was highly brittle and huh. so very easy uh, to fracture. And so um, in the years as we figured uh, this out and developed solutions, definitely the solutions are better. Mm -hmm. uh, and then 
uh, you know, in 2010, we've completely rewritten now the seismic steel provisions from scratch wow. using all the work that had been learned from those years. So 1994 to 2010, that's a typical, uh, typically how long the process takes when it's urgent. Wow. That, yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. unfortunately, I'm familiar with that, yeah. with how, 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 how long it takes to, to make sort of systemic change in, uh, in the policy side of what, what we do. Um, Regarding, okay, I just want to, I want to get back to the, um, this issue about defining the problem. And I think you, we've, we've talked about that, but the, how about the distance from your first um, self-described, one of the worst ideas you've ever had, the, the whole building kind of like a, a, a 55 gallon drum sitting on half of a, half of a piece of fruit or something yes. like that in a pit. Yep. Um, how did you get to that one, and then how did you move on from that one, if, I, if that's a fair question? So um, I think part of the issue is the composition of the team mm. and the uh, different things that the team brings to the table. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also sometimes, you know, ideas don't just pop up from nowhere. Mm -hmm. It takes years sometimes of trying things over and over and over right. again right. Uh, before you can finally get to it. And uh, so in this case, certainly composition of the team made a difference. And we changed the team in the next year. Uh, and you know, the first team were all excellent. And, and, and yet the mixture of the ideas, this is what we came up with. And mm. I'll take mm. responsibility for the bad parts. Mm -hmm. And um, then you change the team and you learn from the first experience and you try many iterations and, and it starts to come together. Right, right. Uh, so, so you do go through several iterations you know, yes. when, we, when we get to the to the, the next buzzword, ideate, yeah. the idea. See, I, you know, this is really interesting for me to learn because of course, in architecture, sure, we, you know, a, a, a house I designed, I, I, I recently stumbled upon a stack of yellow trace drawings, the very thin onion skin kind of uh, translucent paper that designers use to sketch over another sketch. Mm -hmm. I recently found a, a stack of these in my basement, mm. and it was, uh, there were, I don't know, 300 images of the facade of, the, yes. of a simple house, yeah. okay? <laughs> I can't tell you, it, almost every mathematical possibility of, of how to do that. Yes. How do you guys come up with, are they, are they thumbnail sketches? Are they, math, are they mathematical formula? How do you go about ideating, if you will, yeah. or brainstorming? So um, it starts first with an understanding of uh, first principles in mm. the field. Mm. Uh, so in our case, uh, mechanics, for right. example, mechanics of materials, mechanics of behavior. Right. Um, and then you, through much practice, you start to build up intuition for how different types of tr structures and components behave. Right. Right. And then you start to try to piece those together. Right. And uh, we'll often do uh, everything from back of the envelope calculations, estimations of behavior, um, through more sophisticated nonlinear computational analyses mm -hmm. in order to try to do that. And when you're writing a proposal, sometimes you don't have time to do that much, and you still need a good portion of the idea in there. Mm. Uh, but of course, when you're doing the work, uh, then we have many iterations of analysis, trying out new ideas. Um, you know, my graduate students certainly know that they'll uh, uh, work very hard, bring me ideas, and uh, in 30 seconds I'll say, I don't think so, mm -hmm. and then they go back and they try again. Mm -hmm. uh, but eventually we get there. So that, th your, your consultation with your own students in a way is the, is the very, very, very preliminary form of, of testing. Yes. Their idea is a prototype, and you're the first test. Yep. And so if, if no, that just won't work on its face because those materials are, you know, they, they don't work together or something yes. like that. But once you do get to prototyping and testing, obviously, I mean, I, I don't know how many people in this room had seen uh, what you call a, uh, what is the thing in Kobe? Kobe? A shake table. A shake table. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's astonishing. And that, that yeah. must be a, such an expensive piece of equipment. Because Unbelievably expensive. The force in yeah. it's generating. And of course, enormous. the Japanese were so interested in this work that they really put a lot of effort into it as well. We couldn't have done it without the Japanese partners in that case. Right, yeah. right. But now, how, I assume also, you, I'm sure you can do modeling on your computer as well. Yes. How, 
how, how, this may be a naive question, but how advanced, how coherent does your idea have to be in order to be able to test it uh, in, a, in a 3D model kind of way? So, I mean, uh, Does it possible, have to be fully cooked? Um, different engineers might work differently. Mm -hmm. uh, different projects might work differently. So, but typically I'd like to see uh, quite a bit of computational analysis before we go into the lab. Mm -hmm. uh, because you can fix something in an analysis mm -hmm. and rerun it, and uh, taking advantage of that is really key. Mm -hmm. And you can do parametric studies. Mm -hmm. You could see sweeps of behavior, and you mm -hmm. could try out different things. Mm -hmm. uh, but very hard to simulate some of the complexities of what we're trying to do always in a computational model. Uh -huh. When I put forward a, a, a set of tests, we try to start with simpler, more fundamental tests that give us some idea about whether the key concepts of our system will work. Right. Um, this is happening right now in Design for Deconstruction. Right. Uh, we're, um, we're trying to figure out how to put together and hold together these planks. Right. And um, then you work up, uh, and this could be over a period of years, to some of the bigger system tests. Right. So it's necessary to build up a methodology like that and to learn how to build up a methodology like that. I'm so glad you brought up the planks issue mm. because, um, you know, the, the di and, and I don't know if everybody... Uh, latched on to the distinction between um, welded steel and bolted steel. Mm. The idea that you can unbolt steel and it's pretty hard to unweld it. Uh, yes, harder. Harder. Yes. Um, so this idea about um, component, you know, components that you can take back apart. Yeah. There's, a, there's an interesting parking garage at the Kendall Square Cinema that you may be aware of in mm. Cambridge mm. that looks to me like it's mostly uh, made of, and parking garages are much likelier to be this way because you, they, they have the mm. sort of structural planks yes. that are both deck and structure. Yes. Um, and they can be laid into a, a, a steel frame that is maybe cable, that it achieves its rigidity by, by cables or something. I think that's the case there. But once you get past that building type, mm -hmm. um, it, it seems to me that it just my intuition is that this is uh, the, you're solving for two quite different problems. If you're solving for seismic on the one hand and the ability to take it, everything apart on the other, how do you like when that plank system, which as we recall ha showed um, uh, concrete pre-stressed concrete planks with a groove in them that sat right on top of a steel beam? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So how does how do how do you how do you optimize for both uh, the rigidity and or the ability to withstand seismic and also the ability to take apart effortlessly. All right. So um, the way in which we're right now trying to attach the clamps to the beams mm -hmm. is with clamps. Mm -hmm. uh, relatively new products that have come out to be able to take as much force mm -hmm. as we need. And literally like a uh, yes, okay. literally like tightening a clamp. All right, thank and you. and uh, you know, some of the constraints that come into our design process are uh, estimations, uh, my estimations in this case, of what the structural engineering community will accept, right. what the contractors will accept, and even what the building, uh, the people who write the building codes will accept. Uh, I mean, there's a potential whole shift in industries that might occur with right. something like this. And so, you know, we start with a system like this, which is meant to represent a floor system, by thinking about some of the simpler loads, like gravity load. Uh, but we're constantly looking at what happens if this is part of a seismic system, mm. uh, where the floor system is going to have to throw all the force into those lateral systems, right, right, for right, example, right, out right. of the perimeter. So we're incorporating that in the design. And it's iterative. You know, we'll do some stuff related to one set of loads and try to come up with the ideas because it's simpler. Then we'll start to see how they work in something more complicated like an earthquake, right. for example. Well, um, this is a good moment to point out that um, this theme, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a, uh, uh, more than a whiff of um, prefab thinking, prefabrication, yes. and therefore uh, standardization yes. in this kind of work. And one of our subsequent guests in the course is somebody, I don't know if you know, Joe Tanney, mm. who is an architect in New York City. He uh, runs a firm called Resolution for Architecture. Mm. Resolution, the number four architecture. And they are probably the most successful prefab mm. housing architects in the United States at, at a high end. Mm. Um, I don't want to, you know, there are 
industrial manufacturing associated with all kinds of residential construction. But this is uh, sort of more in the tradition of the dream, the sort of modernist dream of pre prefabrication. And it seems to me that this is something that is absolutely going, it's inevitable that this is going to grow because the costs of customizing everything, whether it's in structural engineering, whether it's in architecture, uh, what you might say meaningless customization as opposed to meaningful, well-designed prototypes that address mm -hmm. multiple issues that have to do with environment, that have to do with energy use, that have to do with exactly cost, right. all these kinds of things. So for budding designers and engineers in the audience, um, I think it's worth noting that in terms of big themes, this is definitely one that is going to inform your future. Yes. Prefabrication, um, you, you know, we already have what some people call and been call it, you know, mass customization, right? Mm -hmm. Mass production on the one hand, your iPhone, but on the other hand, it's your phone. Mm -hmm. It has your stuff on it. It mm -hmm. has, you've configured it the way you want. It mm -hmm. does what you want it to do. I think that you're going to see much more of this kind of stuff mm -hmm. probably in the engineering world and certainly I think in the architectural world and I think broadly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, that's something to... This is fundamental why we did that project. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're trying to come up with the structural solutions, but it's clearly driven by sustainability, by prefabricated solutions. Right. I think it's a, it's a huge revolution uh, waiting to happen. Yeah. Now, the trick is, one of the many obstacles to this, one is institutions. The institutions. Institutions that have grown up in support of the way things are. Yep. Um, you know, this is happening in higher education with the explosion of for-profit and online stuff. I mean, I, we're going to weather it just fine, but the industry is changing dramatically. Hmm. Um, and it's happening in, 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 in all kinds of things, I think, for these same reasons. Yes. Um, and um, it, it does remain to be seen if we will be able to get out of our own way um, to, yes. to actually welcome innovation yes. rather, rather than institutionally resist it. Yes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm surprised to hear, I, I, I guess I just hadn't thought about it that much, but th there, there will be resistance in structural engineering simply because, look, we're set up to do it this way. What, yes. what do you mean? Why should we change and start doing everything a different way? Yep. So the regulators are the, are the ones to get to because if the regulations change, the, the, the industry has to change. Uh, yes. Is that That's right? That's correct. Yes. That's right. I, yep. Not a structural engineer, but that would seem like the weak link in the chain. If you could, if you could, I mean, it may be very hard to. So I, I think of it as if, if the regulations change, that gives us the opportunity yeah. to change. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I would anticipate at least for a while they're not going to um, remove the right. way we're currently doing right. it. Right. But uh, if we can get them to add some alternatives to give engineers confidence that these are safe, structurally safe, uh, that could be a huge step forward. Um, another question about. Uh, especially in as much as your uh, administrative role is heading both stru uh, uh, structural and civil engineering, mm -hmm. uh, or civil and environmental, I guess is mm -hmm. the right distinction. Um, with regard to all these ports, and I love, by the way, the way you framed in your presentation why this matters. Yeah. In other words, it, so many people that we know and, and designers of all kinds of things, they get immediately to the fine grain, this is what I'm interested in, and I'm gonna, let's get into the, into, into the weeds immediately. Yes. The reason this stuff matters is you see where commer global commerce takes place, yep. and the ports in this country number fewer than 10 that are really gigantic and, and central to the whole infrastructure of the country. Yes. And how many of those are, are they all vulner really vulnerable? Who would, which, which ones would you put at the top of the vulnerability list? Is it I, like, I am not going to answer that question. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's Good say question. they're all... Please, please note, audience, that was an excellent <laughs> question. Uh, and we'll... Uh, they all have their special vulnerabilities. Okay. <laughs> uh, our but, guests are aware that these uh, talks are, are recorded. Yes. So I, I, think, I, I think we should, we should so, keep this But I mind. will say, you know, if there's one major thing that I wish I had learned more as an undergrad, it's uh, not to simply focus on what I would call component design, which of course is your disciplinary design skills that are fundamental and that you need to know. Right. It's looking at the whole community right. Uh, right. and the impact of these designs on the community and how to have that directly inform um, your design. And I think architects have perhaps done this as well as anybody. Not enough going on in engineering. No, I, 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 I agree actually. I mean, I think uh, there are uh, lots of things that architects could do better, lots, but one thing that they, are trained to do, I think, 
is to understand that their role is often actually as the choreographer of a lot of different specialties. And as the world has gotten more specialized, we've had to be more comfortable with that role because in the old days, really, just 50 years ago, many architects who had their own practice, which is a lot of the architects in the United States, did design houses and small buildings, many who had their own practice did their own structural engineering. You know, I mean, yes. they did. They were, Jack they were like Thomas Jefferson. They did, yes. they did everything. And uh, now that's just not true even on the smallest projects. Mm. Um, yeah. You have a structural engineer, you have an MEP engineer at minimum, and then yeah. you have, probably have several others. That's Nowadays, true. systems and yes. so the idea that you're, I mean, you have to zoom out because you're coordinating lots of people. So anyway, I think that's a- yeah, It's a much more exciting design space. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's true. Um, and I do think that zooming out to the sort of the themes of this course, um, the idea that everybody actually has to be a designer in a way, um, that is, has to think about what problem it is they're solving. When you go to the, your first day of work on your co-op job, well, the first day of work, you absolutely do exactly what your boss tells you. That's my advice, uh, unquestioningly. But you should reflect on what is the mission of the enterprise you're working at. Not just what were you asked to do, what is the enterprise here? Because if you are a smart and thoughtful person, you'll be able to add more value by understanding what that is, understanding what the role of the business is or the, 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 the task of the enterprise. I, I, I don't think we can stress that enough. Um, I want to, um, the reason I asked about the ports, and I promise I won't ask any, any, any more um, scary questions on that front, but what are some of the, you know, with these dramatic, it, it seems clear that these weather events are getting more erratic anyway and less predictable. Mm -hmm. Aside from building gigantic walls, uh, sea walls to protect these places, um, and aside from the low, let's call it the low hanging fruit of, you know, in some places replenishing our barrier islands, and which is a big deal, I know. Yeah. Um, but that, and that it seems like, on, frankly, aside from a few homeowners who may live on such islands, I'm talking about especially, you know, on the, on the Carolina coast or in Louisiana, and, and, and maybe here too, um, but there are some places where a lot of those barrier islands and um, what are they, what are, the, what are the sort of marshy areas called? Yep. Uh, wetlands. And so yeah, the wetlands yep. and so forth um, have been denuded in, in, in the for constant industrialization of the country. So let's say certainly the idea about replenishing the, doing what we can to replenish those areas is a great idea. Mm -hmm. But what are some other things between that kind of natural solution and walling off the harbors and putting in giant gates a la the Dutch? Mm -hmm. What are some things that, that yep. you guys think about us doing? Uh, so first, I think it's going to be helpful if we understand some of the interactions uh, between uh, the infrastructure and coastal communities. Mm -hmm. So uh, water, wastewater, power, communications, uh, transportation and the building stock mm -hmm. uh, so that we understand the relationships between uh, how damage in one area might impact another. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a deep understanding of that now and particularly not a deep understanding of which of these systems, if any, can bounce back quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just to give an example, the power grid tends to be one of our more adaptable systems right now. If mm. something happens in a portion of the power grid, sometimes they can make up for it. Right, Not right. too many of our other systems can address things quite that comprehensively. And I think by studying that, that will help really identify what the, what the true vulnerabilities are in particular areas, what the high priority vulnerabilities are. Uh, then from there, I would like to uh, start to investigate a variety of smart designs. I'd like to try to take fuse-based concepts exactly uh, into um, many different aspects of uh, infrastructure design. Uh, so, you know, we're starting to see uh, buildings now that um, try to have sacrificial floors mm -hmm. to get ready for storm surge. I'm not sure if that's a good idea, but it's certainly a start. And mounting all uh, vital systems on the roof instead of in the basement? That's correct. Right. And of course, the reasons why we, for example, put a lot of generators uh, in the basement um, right now, which is perhaps the worst place for them, might have historical reasons that go back 100 years right, right, um, right. and are, are, are stuck in the building codes right now right, uh, right. with um, a lot of inertia required to change those. Right, right. Uh, 
federal government is actually starting to recognize this and is looking for some systemic addressing of resilience right, right. Um, in a variety of ways, but we have a long way to go. Yeah. I think, I, I, I'm so glad you mentioned the sort of fuse-based concept because that is, stri strikes me as a kind of game-changing way of thinking about all these kinds of systemic issues. And um, it makes me realize, um, I've known you, what, maybe three or four years? Mm, four. Four years. Mm -hmm. um, until preparing for this, I had no idea how um, impactful your work is in this area. And it's, it's, it's really st stunning and very impressive. Um, are others uh, uh, trying to leverage this idea about uh, fuse-based uh, thinking in, 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 in matters of coastal resilience? Mm. Certainly, um, a few colleagues who I've worked on this with over the years are outstanding at this. Mm -hmm. uh, my colleagues at Stanford, uh, um, there have been a few other schools around the country that have been looking at it. There have been some um, early adopters among the practitioners. With respect specifically to coastal, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I've seen that much directly. And that's one of the reasons why we're working on it hard here right, to try right. to develop that. Well, you know, um, the city of Providence, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with much about Providence, but it has... I grew up in Rhode Island. Oh, you did? Oh, my yeah. goodness. Okay. Well, if I'm not mistaken, it has, uh, it's the only area that I know of nearby that has big sea gates protecting its harbor mm. or it's, it, it's a, a portion of its downtown waterfront. Yes. Um, and I th it has some advantages in the sense that that particular finger of, you know, if you look at the plan of Rhode Island, it has millions of fingers of water coming in to it. But, you know, so in a way it's super vulnerable. But in another way, it allows you a finger at a time you to have um, a fairly narrow entrance through which in a surge water might come if it were manageable. Exactly. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Right. So I think that's why, unlike Boston, which, by the way, if, if you haven't seen it, I, a colleague of mine 25 years ago, uh, Antonio de Mambro, uh, did a proposal for a then future distant future thing called Boston 2000. Mm. <laughs> it's like 1984, you know. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it come, now it's, now it's gone. Mm -hmm. But Boston 2000, he proposed um, linking some of the harbor islands mm. with barrier causeways mm. and creating a couple of entry points. And it actually, yes, it would have cost a ton of dough, but it's, in retrospect, a really good idea. Mm. But, I, I mean, if you're going to go mm -hmm. the route of trying to wall things off. Now, if there's, a, if there's another, and in some cases, my suspicion is, as with so many design issues, everything is context. Hmm. If you have a vast, broad, sweeping opening to the ocean, yeah. <laughs> building a wall is probably not option A. Right. You probably got to find something that will slay the dragon, or mit not slay it, mitigate the most excessive, you know, the worst case scenario to the best of mm -hmm. your ability. Yes, that's right. I'd also like to mention that um, our friends in social science uh, become increasingly important mm. for things like this. You could talk about incentives, economic incentives. Mm. You could talk about public policies. Right. You could talk about laws. Right. Um, and, you know, in terms of resilience specifically, so much of what's vital in our country is um, with the private sector. Uh, and if there aren't necessarily codes in place that require them to bounce back quickly, for example, right. They, they don't have to design for it. Yeah. And um, so there's many intricate layers of this right. that I think make it increasingly challenging, uh, even just beyond the logistics of right. building a seawall. Well, you know, it's, it's just something that I gave a lecture years ago called um, Thinking Public in a Private Age. Mm -hmm. And it is, a, it is a structural problem of our system of organization, which does yes. many things very well, yes. but, but when it comes to long-term thinking about collective interests, it's pretty bad at it. <laughs> Let me ask you, I'm going to uh, turn it over to the students in just a second, so if you have a question, please get ready to um, come up and ask it, um, and, or send it by Twitter to the hashtag Understanding Design, and one of the TAs will ask it. Um, but there is, you know, uh, and you probably know more countries, but certainly the Netherlands, by virtue of 
geography and water level or, or, or um, their elevation have been in this business for a long time. Um, and it's an absolute cannot fail kind of situation uh, because, you know, they, they live below sea level. Most, most of it is, anyway. Mm -hmm. Are there, and I, you know, are there examples of how they have dealt with um, rising oceans or simply the presence of the ocean that are better and worse, in your view? In other words, I, they seem willing to experiment with lots of different things, and they mm -hmm. can't all be great ideas. Mm. Well, uh, do you have any yeah. sense about that? Um, I'm not sure I can give a thorough answer on that, but I certainly agree with, uh, with the context, that they have been exploring ideas, um, that they have some great engineering uh, mm -hmm. in this area, uh, that their understanding of, um, of water resources uh, is quite intricate. And in general, um, I think Europe is more advanced than us, mm -hmm. in part because these countries perhaps are smaller, mm -hmm. um, and they're able to make advances politically yep. um, quicker. Uh, they're able to focus their resources uh, better. Um, in terms of the details of, of that, I can't speak to okay. that. Okay, that's, that, it's fine. Yeah, I completely agree with you about Europe, by the way. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a permanent base in Berlin, and one of the reasons we do is that um, it all comes from uh, the Green Party winning the election in West Germany in the mid-80s. Yes. Not making this up, it changed every, it changed all of Europe. Yep. Because it got its way into the building code, and then it became the building code for a unified Germany. Everybody said Germany's got the best laws, and then it became basically the European Union kind of situation. And yes. their performance expectations for energy use, for access to light, for fresh air, for, all those issues is vastly, the, the regulatory environment mm -hmm. has moved the whole industry dramatically forward. And interestingly, sometimes the flip happens when an earthquake brings the downfall of government. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, interesting. Okay, do we have uh, uh, questions from the audience? Do we have any on the, yeah, sure. My name is Ian. I just wanted to thank you for coming today. And uh, I had a question about your design work and where you look for inspiration hmm. to solve the problems, like the way you came up with your solution to the, the whole fuse thing. So maybe um, was there was there an, uh, uh, something that, that, that stirred that particular solution? That's a great question. Um, well, I could tell you what motivated it is what we discussed, that we knew that the new solutions we were coming with, up with after the Northridge earthquake was going to continue to put damage into mm. components of the building that were difficult to replace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a specific uh, inspiration for that, I would be hard pressed to say. Mm -hmm. I haven't thought about it too directly. Of course, the word fuse comes from the electric fuse box in the basement, right. but you need an old house to know that. Right, right, right. And uh, now, inspiration for many other aspects of how I think about design are from many sources. Uh, certainly some are what I put up there, such as uh, great work of Les Robertson, uh, Bill Baker. I've uh, been able to talk to some of these engineers over the years, uh, and in some cases the architects, to understand their thinking patterns. Um, and what they consider to be important. And, um, and then the same from uh, the mechanics community and some of the fundamental ways they think about material behavior uh, and how you build that material response into a structural system. Um, so that's where we get the inspiration from. I'll have to think about the particular system. That's an interesting well, question. Well, I, 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 yeah. I can expand on that a little bit in the sense that um, I think the inspiration that we get from hearing about it is tied to the metaphor of the fuse. Hmm. We can all understand what a fuse is. You didn't say circuit breaker, hmm. which would be something that you could not, that was, you didn't even need to replace. You just flipped it back in, into position. Hmm. You know what I mean? And that, it's meaningful to me anyway to think conceptually about a solution that is a fuse, and that's how we were able to quickly jump from the structural example, which is extremely specific, yes. to the idea of a fuse-based approach to the coastal thing. Yes. Because it, it does conjure up, it, metaphor is much more um, 
uh, allows you to move from context to context yes. in a way that specific, detailed description of the problem doesn't. And yeah. I, I don't, did, the, did calling the fuse come before or after? I think after. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what would Karen but, Kaplan call that? Post-rationalization. Yeah. Ninety-five percent of our decisions are uh, are emotional. Yeah. And so when we make a decision to buy this, we post-rationalize. Although if I went back to the proposal, we'll see if the word is there. I haven't gone back to that. Look. Would, but I, I did think about um, a little bit more of an answer, uh, which is which I think is a little bit interesting. So the pre-Northridge connections, as we call them, which are the ones that failed, um, those were actually tested. Uh, in the 1970s and 1980s uh, with the greatest earthquake steel engineers of the time, Igor Popov, University of California, Berkeley, and many of his students. Um, they developed these connections. They were very cost effective to build, and he tested them in, in the labs. And of course, one of the known stories in our profession is that um, some of those connections fractured, but a lot of them didn't. And uh, if you look at the papers that came out, they reported the fractures, and everybody went, hmm. Uh, and Igor Popov was very well known. He thought they were OK. I think he made a reasonable decision at the time based on what was known. Into the building codes they go, and they become ubiquitous, not only on the West Coast, but around the country, mm -hmm. and it, to some extent around the world. After the Northridge earthquake in those first meetings, uh, Igor Popov, he's now passed away, was a very senior person, and he was quite aware of what happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't put it all on one person. This was a huge industry mm -hmm. that was developed. But he, at one of the meetings, put forward an idea that I hadn't thought about in a while uh, that perhaps started spurring us to thinking about these things. He took some brass shims, and he put them in the plies of a bolted steel moment connection and wanted to engage the friction and the ductility uh, in the brass shim to dissipate some of the energy rather than relying on just the steel. Mm -hmm. And so he was already yeah. innovating very quickly after the earthquake, trying to figure out um, what we can do. Huh. So, and there's a few other examples of that as, as I think back. Um, there'd been some people who had looked at damping solutions uh, where you put a damper um, in the structural system in order to damp out the solution that has some relevance to it, so maybe that's where we got the inspirations from. Great, thank yeah. you. Other questions? Okay, this is, this is coming to us from the ether. Yeah, so it said, how can these ideas be applied to existing buildings? For economic reasons, we clearly can't simply rebuild everything. Great question. Yes, um, I think these ideas can be applied to existing buildings, and in fact, they are being applied to existing buildings, um, especially in Japan, uh, where I've seen several examples. Um, there's, uh, so one of the ideas that's been coming out uh, since this one, I like a lot, it's called a self-centering brace. And it's a self-contained diagonal brace, like you would see in our diagonal brace frame system. Uh, that has a self-centering mechanism as well as an energy dissipating mechanism. Um, and so uh, you're able to focus a lot of the damage into the self-centering brace. You have to keep an eye on your columns and girders in the brace frame, uh, but it's quite feasible to try to use these in a retrofit strategy. Um, sometimes they also, uh, and you'll see these on the West Coast, they'll build an exterior uh, seismic resisting system right around the building. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that will use some of these newer concepts. And so those are, those are some ways you could do it. And, and this, is, this is a great question because um, when you see how much money is spent on retrofitting important civic building, buildings that have cultural importance in a city like the San Francisco City Hall, yes, yes. I don't know how much money they spent retroactively. Uh, they yes. had to, well, I think they put base isolators there, which I guess is another type of solution mm. to try to prevent damage in extreme events. There are other solutions okay. out there. Yeah, we just don't call them fuses. I yeah, guess. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, this was definitely. Yeah, I didn't mean this was a fuse thing. It's mm -hmm. just it is a huge issue undertaking. Yes. Um, whether you're doing it uh, beforehand or afterwards, if the structure survives, uh, that's right. It's uh, this is a huge issue, and building this. Building this kind of capacity into structures from the get-go is certainly a, a great, <laughs> would be a great leap forward. Yes. Um, other questions? No. Okay. 
All right, folks, the, the assignment goes online tonight at 5 o'clock. Please make sure it's done by Monday at 5 p.m. Thank you very much, and we'll see you Monday.